Section 14 of Notes of an East Coast Naturalist by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miscellaneous Notes, Part 1 On Dogs Dogs do not like me, and I do not care for them, and the following notes about them would not have been written but for the fact that the animals mentioned exhibited not only uncommon intelligence, but a thorough sportive disposition, and a peculiar persistency in following up the bent of their genius. Lubbock, in his Observations on the Fauna of Norfolk, mentions the curly-coated retriever as the one species of dog very common here, though not peculiar to the county, the Yarmouth water dog, as they are generally termed in other parts of England. He then refers to a dog of this kind kept at a drainage mill on the Braden marshes. In winter, this dog would go off by itself and search the flint walls for wounded wildfowl. These, as is well known, always endeavour to creep into some nook or corner. When the wind blew from the northeast, and ducks were numerous on Braden, he sometimes carried home eight or nine fowl of various kinds in a morning. The wild fowlers at that time, many years ago, wrote Lubbock, when referring to this particular incident, did not carry hand guns, so many disabled birds would flutter away from them over the ice or in the dusk. Having left a bird at the mill, the dog would continue his search, picking up the trail where he had left off. He resented not only interference, but even intrusion, and seeing a man coming towards him, would cross a wide ditch and go the longest way home. Another dog of a kindred species was kept by a shore gunner, for whom it used to retrieve wounded or slaughtered fowl. This dog would, at certain times, more especially in periods of severe frost and strong winds, go hunting on his own account, and take home such fowl as he could find. From his master, who worked in one of the shipyards, he would sneak quietly away, and having discovered a duck or some wading bird, come back to the yard and lay it at his feet. No one else dared to touch the fowl. An aged gunner of my acquaintance, a man rather above the average intelligence of his class, used to shoot a great deal in the fifties and sixties, on the beach, sand hills and marshes with a shoulder gun. Billy had two or three dogs in his time that shared his sport with him. One, a white mongrel, was of great assistance at flighting. On those marshes, then known as the allotments, and now carefully drained, and in places cropped, the townsfolk used to turn hundreds of geese. Towards evening, the goose herds came to bring home their respective flocks, and had considerable difficulty in persuading them to leave this, to them, paradise of swamp. Billy's dog, on arrival, would materially help rounding up, hustling, and driving roadwards the laggard geese, after which he would place himself at his master's disposal in retrieving such fowl as might be shot. Another equally devoted mongrel would frequently scent small birds in the furze patches on the common, and as they were flushed, he would spring adroitly into the air and catch them in his mouth. He once ran down and caught a lark, carrying it home in his mouth uninjured. A neighbour secured the bird, which was put in a cage, and lived for three or four years in captivity. 
no less than five different woodcocks did this dog in his time track down and capture as they sprang at his coming he would also dive into the ditches seize a small pike and bring it out alive on one occasion a friend was out shooting with billy near the allotments and had reached a field where turnips were growing the friend had a mind for a turnip being somewhat hungry after a long walk but could not reach it owing to a high bank and a ditch at the foot of it fetch one said his master and the dog sprang over fixing upon a good turnip the dog wrung and wrenched at it until he succeeded in pulling it up then back he came with it dangling in his mouth it happened that the farmer who was some distance off saw the dog's strange behaviour and shortly after on meeting billy he expressed surprise at the incident more especially at the dog's vanishing over the bank with it he's very fond of turnips said the dog's master this still further bewildered the farmer but on being told the actual circumstances he was greatly amused a gunner had been shooting at the bure side having with him an intelligent retriever bitch he had loaded his gun and in a moment of absent-mindedness left the powder flask on a stone whereon the axis of a mill wheel turned when nearing home he suddenly missed his flask and happening to turn round saw it in his dog's mouth she having picked it up and followed closely at his heels carrying it stoat and weasel on the sand hills beyond caister where rabbits abound the stoat is not unknown near a home however its appearance is an event only on two or three occasions have i met with one on the sand dunes near the town one poor bewildered thing hunting for an unwary snow bunting or anything else that might fall to his lot was suddenly surprised by a friend of mine who was quite as amazed himself so much so indeed that ere it occurred to him to use his gun the animal had viciously jumped at his legs and literally forced him into an impromptu jig when as if by magic it disappeared and hunt as he would he could not discover the hole into which it must have vanished the probability is that he closed with his heel the burrow the stoat entered the moment the animal had disappeared another stoat regularly patrolled the seashore morning after morning in search of food its footprints were visible leading to and from the sand hills whilst here and there broken fragments and well cleaned carapaces of the spider crab hyas coactatus were to be found these crabs no doubt offered the animal a pleasing change diet from the larks and pipits it must have been seeking before the dawn and while they were yet napping in the tussocks of marum grass one morning in august nineteen hundred i was quietly drifting downstream on braden when i noticed some small animal suddenly plunge in from the walls and commence swimming bravely into the broad stream of the channel undoubtedly with the intention of seeing what he could do amongst a number of gulls gathered on the five stake flat although not intending to get too close upon him my boat drifted across his track when the animal a weasel showed fight and endeavoured to climb into my punt a proceeding i objected to and i was obliged to gently tap him on the head with the blade of my oar he sank quite a yard squirming and protesting but on rising to the surface 
very wisely turned shorewards and vigorously paddling soon reached the bank disappearing in the flintstone fronted embankment i had no desire to hurt him but a desperate weasel in the confined quarters of a punt was by no means a desirable passenger i have always regretted since that i did not wait to see how he fared amongst the powerful gulls that had tempted him to the adventure an up-to-date bat since the introduction of powerful electric street lamps into the town great numbers of various moths occasionally dance around them baffled and bewildered by the glare i have seen a wall opposite a lamp speckled with resting insects late on the night of the twenty first of september nineteen o three i observed a small bat flittering around the lamps on the north quay it had evidently discovered that prey was to be found at a late hour around the lamps and intended to profit by knowledge of it foraging rats the brown rat is by no means a scarce animal in yarmouth and no one has a good word to say for it its name being associated with much that is evil but there can be no doubt its presence among the flint-faced walls of Braden, where it lives on the carrion drifted there by wind and tide is beneficial rather than not it is simply astonishing how soon the carcass of a large gull a dog or even a pig is reduced to an inoffensive skeleton thus proving that rats are numerous there the beast has become extremely cunning and seldom shows itself until dusk especially during the shooting season when rat potting chances are never rejected even by those who are eager for nobler game some of the older rats are woefully mangy with unsightly tumours bald patches and broken tails testifying to hard knocks fierce fights and unholy living among the timbers of the gorston breakwater in the inaccessible fastnesses of mazes of timber a number of rats have their abode in summer varying their dietary with the crumbs and crusts thrown away by visitors in autumn the herring refuse is never failing and in winter the remnants of crustaceans dead seabirds and even mollusca bear witness to meals enjoyed in the long dark hours after nightfall the footmarks of the rats may be discovered on the sands around over which they have been prowling a long streak here and there bespeaking the occasional trailing of a tail quite half a mile away from the breakwater i have seen these unmistakable tell-tale imprints along the tide mark and it is quite easy after a little practice to form a pretty correct idea of the hour long tail was out on his travels by noting their distance from the last high water mark a plague of black rats although the existence of the black rat moose ratus in yarmouth was known to me in my earliest years and an odd carcass was now and again thrown out from a malt house or a sail loft to be kicked about the streets it was not until eighteen ninety five that i began seriously to make inquiries with regard to its numbers and behaviour in the older parts of the town where it seemed to be more at home than in the newer portions i found out that its presence in the malt houses during the drying season was by no means unknown or seldom noticed whilst at other times when lack of food in these places drove it into warehouses and sail lofts it became quite a nuisance devouring any lumps of russian tallow left about by the sail sowers 
and committing havoc amongst the grocer's goods at these times too the rats made themselves at home in many of the cottages one old lady having to remove because of the persistent way they occupied her pantry and even came into the kitchen and made themselves at home my inquiries and a price set upon each clean killed specimen soon began to bear fruit and day after day dead black rats were brought to me two examples one an immature animal with a small white spot on the breast a not unusual occurrence were dispatched to norwich and a couple of others to edinburgh respecting the latter pair mr w eagle clark wrote at once march the fifth eighteen ninety six the rats you send are most undoubtedly the old english species moose ratus and their occurrence in abundance in yarmouth is an interesting fact moose ratus and moose alexandrinus are considered to be races of the same species the black ratus being the form found in temperate regions and the brown alexandrinus the tropical one on the sixteenth of march i obtained two adult black rats and saw lying dead and too far gone for preservation four rats of a bluish grey colour below and of a rich brown above their long tails large ears and small size all going to prove that i had fallen in with the rarer moose alexandrinus from that date the black rat turned up day after day for a long period indeed until i had secured considerably over a hundred on the twentieth of march i obtained an adult female with white feet also a small white spot on the chest and another on the head aged examples are adorned with a sprinkling of very long hairs some of them intensely black with a few quite white showing here and there it was suggested to me that some of these had probably come ashore from grain ships but as these usually lie on the west side of the river and south town is quite apart from it this theory was hardly feasible the older part of yarmouth known as the row district is a stronghold of the animal and it was not until a year or so ago that it had crossed regent street and made its appearance in the northern part of the town for a very long time moose alexandrinus evaded me that variety being curiously scarce although quite able to hold its own with ratus a higher premium certainly conduced to the capture of one or two in the latter part of april eighteen ninety six a fleet of old fishing smacks that had been brought for some useless purpose from grimsby were found to be infested with these rats and as it was anticipated these vessels might be sent to sea endeavours were made to exterminate them for this purpose iron trays covered with red-hot ashes and certain combustibles were placed in the holds and cabins of two or three vessels at a time above these fires was shot a considerable amount of pepper the smokers immediately repaired to the decks and shut down every avenue of escape plastering soft clay or mud over every crevice through which the fumes could escape in the morning the hatches were taken off and the cabins ventilated here and there laid rats of all ages and sizes dead from suffocation in the bunks in cupboards everywhere but the majority were found in the neighbourhood of the trays as if the poor brutes gathering to see what strange burnings these were 
had been overcome as they discussed the situation on the twelfth of june i went down a fresh opened smack with the smoker and saw quite a pedful of dead rats amongst them some fine examples of moose alexandrinus i filled my handkerchief with them but very few were preserved for the baking process had made them so susceptible to decomposition that in an hour or two they were beyond manipulation a young taxidermist managed to skin and cure eight of them and then desisted i obtained two half-grown examples of moose ratus alive in a wire trap and dispatched them to the zoological gardens they were returned promptly the next day with hardly a suggestion of thanks and with the information that they had already more than they wanted i supplied several museums with specimens including cromwell road in july 1901 a tradesman living on the quay was greatly annoyed by the misdoings of the black rats on his premises he set a steel fall and found in it next day the tail of a victim that had managed to get away with the loss of that lengthy member he good-humouredly showed the tail to his next-door neighbour demanding the owner of it should he by chance secure it and sure enough two days after the trapping of the injured animal actually came about and the rat minus a tail with the close-shorn stump almost perfectly healed was taken to the first and rightful captor with a message attached to it asking to have the doubly unfortunate quadruped retailed Perseverous voles in august eighteen ninety four i went for a day's fishing on lound run a few miles from yarmouth whilst sitting in a boat i observed some small animal and subsequently another i was not sure that it was not a young otter that had come up out of the water at the margin of the opposite bank dragging i could not tell what with it and disappearing in the grass for a time my curiosity abated and i thought no more of the matter even after walking later on to the spot and finding the broken valves of the swan mussel lying about believing at that time the water vole micritus amphibious to be an entirely herbivorous animal it did not occur to me that this must have been the little fellow at work but a letter came to me on the eleventh of april eighteen ninety six from the late sir edward newton in which he wrote i see you mention in your paper that the water vole is exclusively herbivorous now on the eleventh of april eighteen eighty four when with mr southall on the marshes near ranworth we observed on the banks of the dykes quantities of the empty shelves of the large bivalve anodonta i think it is which had one valve almost destroyed a portion only remaining attached to the other valve by the hinge which was seldom damaged and we came to the conclusion that this was the work of a water vole unless it was that of an otter as there were no other animals which could have performed the operation so neatly and so thought the voles found it more convenient to hold the closed shell the same way as with one exception the same valve was always broken and we must have seen at least fifty of the shells so treated this communication revived my interest in lound and at the first convenient opportunity i went there again on the twelfth of september i examined quite a number of broken valves lying upon one or two tiny islands 
just above the surface of the lake quite little heaps were to be seen the shells broken open exactly as described with smaller chips in profusion showing where nibbling had been done and what was still more convincing where the voles had been seated their excrement lay fresh and unmistakable the dung of the vole is very unlike that of the otter besides otters are not to be found in that neighbourhood shortly after this i received a communication from west norfolk wherein mention was made of the way water voles secured crayfish and brought them out upon the bank to break and devour at their leisure in the august of eighteen ninety six i was at my houseboat at kendall dyke in the broad district i had taken some small fish and afterwards threw them upon the bank behind me on the morning following my piscatorial feat i was surprised to find my roach half eaten the upper sides being devoured to the backbone there were unmistakable signs of some rodent having been there i pegged down some more small roach in the evening and by keeping a careful outlook discovered the depredators to be none other than water voles in neither instance the vole has been proved to be guilty of any serious misdemeanour and i shall be sorry indeed to know that my satisfactorily proving him to be at least piscivorous in his tastes does him the slightest harm he is a delightful trim unobtrusive little fellow good company enough too when one is in the solitudes of the silent highway his merry gambols with his kind are pleasing to watch and the way he spends his idle moments and his busy hours is most interesting to observe albinos and varieties of this species are by no means common four white examples were killed however a few miles out of the town in eighteen ninety two and a cream-coloured one was noticed by a ditch side on the caister marshes a year or two after the mole the mole is common enough everywhere but few persons beyond its enemy the mole catcher pay much heed to its doings in frosty weather it is a most reliable barometer and exhibits its forecast of a coming break by the fresh mole heaps thrown up in its travels in the summer of eighteen ninety four i caught one as it was shifting its quarters from one marsh to another i seized the startled creature by the neck but the lissom way in which it squirmed and endeavoured to seize my fingers together with its shrill squeaks induced me speedily to drop it into a handkerchief and thence into an empty pail wherein it danced and capered in quite a frenzy of rage and fright intending to take it home and make a pet of it i left it there all night with some rubbish for burrowing in but found it dead in the morning in eighteen ninety five i discovered several cream-coloured specimens in a field near Acol. i have seen odd ones swimming voluntarily in the bure cetacean notes the porpoise although claiming to be common off the yarmouth coast is somewhat capricious in its visits odd examples and sometimes small companies are seen tumbling about in the roadstead and they disappear as unexpectedly as they come in autumn the porpoise hangs around the herring shoals and now and again makes a great mistake by entangling itself in the herring nets it is treated to a short shrift indeed when hauled aboard the drifter in order to save still further muddling and mauling of the nets 
two men who had been using a longshore net secured a porpoise which they brought into the town alive on a net barrow for exhibition thinking to keep it fresh and lively they occasionally poured a pail of fresh water over it and tried their hardest to pour the water down its blowholes they eventually succeeded in suffocating the hapless beast during the year eighteen ninety one an unusual number of cetaceans visited the norfolk coast my first record was a white-beaked dolphin delphinus albarastris four feet eight inches in length that was washed up dead on the beach at yarmouth on the nineteenth of april i found the skull and fragments of another on the fourteenth of june the skull measured ten inches in length a third example seven feet four inches long was discovered floating up the river on the twenty seventh of august this was secured by some boatmen who created a scandal by exhibiting it upon the marine parade on a wheelbarrow the aroma in a day or two not only drawing together all the flies in the neighbourhood but attracting the attention of a large circle of interested spectators including the sanitary authorities whereby its sojourn within sight of its native element was considerably shortened dead porpoises were washed up on the beach on the eighteenth of july and the first and the fourth of november a full-grown female example of the lesser rorqual balanoptera rostrata by losing its bearings among the numerous sandbanks off the coast eventually found its way into the harbour on the eighth of june eighteen ninety one where it was immediately attacked by a number of galston lifeboatmen and others giving them such a chase as had never before taxed their agility and boatmanship in one of its wildest dashes the frightened animal smashed its nose and then profusely bleeding it was driven between the dolphins a kind of landing stage and the quayside piles where it was attacked with iron creepers boat hooks and other improvised weapons and secured also by ropes and made a complete and helpless prisoner in about an hour it had succumbed to its injuries when it was towed to the lifeboat shed and hauled upon the stocks by means of the windlass here for a day or two it was exhibited to great numbers of townsfolk and afterwards given a public post-mortem dissection to the no small gain of those who had secured it the skin was afterwards stuffed by a local taxidermist and taken for a short time on tour spending the winter in the late royal westminster aquarium and the following summer in a large building on the marine parade at yarmouth where the writer made a fair summer's earnings by exhibiting it to many hundreds of visitors the galston whale was talked of far and near the animal was thirty feet long eighteen feet in girth span of tail eight feet two inches length of pectoral fins four feet six inches length of jaws six feet six inches the baleen ran up to fifteen inches in length in the longest plates in september of the same year a considerable shoal of white-beaked dolphins managed to get into a kind of cul-de-sac made by an accumulation of sand since much altered where the tide being low they floundered about in an excited manner they would have retraced their steps but failing made considerable efforts until splashing and blowing and thrashing with their tails they at length surmounted the barrier and reached deep water their subsequent lively frolics indicating their delight at having escaped 
a fine female white-beaked dolphin was taken in the nets of the herring drifter thankful off this coast on the thirteenth of june eighteen ninety four the beast still alive was bought at the fish wharf and placed on a barrow on which it was driven into the town for exhibition i met it in the street still living as it was being trundled to the purchaser's fish house its travels having been curtailed by police orders with difficulty and much against its will i opened its mouth to admire the fine set of eighty conical clean pearly teeth the animal measured eight feet six inches in length when taken into the house it was stabbed with a knife against which treatment it most stoutly resisted flinging itself about in its agony and fright in a very desperate manner the blood spurting all over the place converting it into about the worst shambles i ever saw two men were knocked over by its struggles and a large herring rack was smashed into pieces on being opened a foetal young one three feet six inches long was found its head was somewhat blunter than that of its parent it weighed four and a half stones and was almost fully matured the estimated weight of the old one was about six hundred weight on the fourteenth of november of the same year a lowestoft drifter found entangled in its nets a grampus seven feet five inches in length it was dragged from lowestoft to yarmouth by two quiet well-behaved fishermen who did some fairly good business by exhibiting it four days afterwards i purchased a second example of this species taken in a precisely similar manner by a yarmouth boat it was two inches shorter but as like to it as the proverbial two peas mr southall referring to these two examples in the transactions of the norfolk and norwich naturalist society thought the fact of the two individuals being so nearly of the same age might seem to indicate that the grampus occasionally gives birth to two young ones the post-mortem of the second grampus may be worth repeating in mr southall's words the second example mr patterson saw on the fish wharf at yarmouth on the nineteenth of november and purchased it for the norwich museum where it arrived on the twentieth when i had an opportunity of examining it owing to the skin being considerably abrased by rough usage it was not in a condition to make a perfect specimen for the museum collection i therefore telegraphed to mr now doctor s f harmer at the university museum of zoology cambridge and at his request sent it to that institution after having made some careful measurements which are worth recording by way of comparison with those of the adult the animal was a female and had probably never taken solid food no trace of which as i was informed by mr harmer was to be found in the stomach or intestines the teeth had not been cut but could be plainly felt in the upper jaw mr harmer tells me there were other indications of extreme juvenility the foetal structures connected with the placenta being very large the presumption is therefore that the animal was still sucking the following is a description of this handsome cetacean the dorsal surface glossy black with the exception of a somewhat oval and sharply defined patch of white commencing in a point just above the eye and extending backward to above and slightly beyond the posterior insertion of the pectoral limb this patch of white or rather cream yellow probably owing to discoloration of the juvenile skin 
was about three times the length of its deepest measurement the ventral surface of the animal was of the same yellowish white divided from the black colour of the upper parts by a sharply defined line very graceful but difficult to describe commencing at the point of the rostrum and passing along the upper border of the mouth from which it was deflected to and under the flipper which was black to within a few inches of the ventral margin of the body where it continued horizontally till about the centre of the dorsal fin then taking a sudden bend upwards and backwards till it reached the centre of the vertical depth of the body at a point immediately below the posterior border of the dorsal fin it continued horizontally as far as midway between the posterior border of the dorsal fin and the insertion of the caudal appendage when it suddenly turned upon itself slanting downwards to within one-third of the distance from the first deflection and resumed the horizontal line until brought to a point by the curvature of the body where it merged into the uniform black colour of the extremity the under surface of the caudal fin was also of the same yellowish white which extended a short distance along the inferior caudal ridge gradually but still sharply defined giving place to the black colour of the under surface of the tapering extremity a detailed table of minute measurements followed on the third of december nineteen hundred a fine female lesser rorqual was cast ashore dead on caister beach it was discovered tumbling about in the surf and a man waded into the water and having cut a hole in the jaw secured it by a rope and in this way with help hauled it farther northwards and secured it on the shore there was some talk about a steam drifter having struck a whale out at sea but no marks that i could see pointed to any impact with the sharp prow of a fishing boat in places the skin was much abraded in all probability by its being toppled about amongst sandbanks its length was thirty feet span of tail flukes seven and a half feet from point to point pectoral flukes four feet in length the smell was by no means pleasant and after both interesting and disgusting numerous visitors the animal was hacked to pieces and buried in the sand the innovation of the steam drifter and the great numbers of herring fishers now at work must have the effect of driving away the cetaceans and making them yearly scarcer in this neighbourhood end of section 14section fifteen of notes of an east coast naturalist by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain miscellaneous notes part two toad notes the list of east coast reptilia and amphibia is not a large one although comprising most of the very small array of british species nor does the race exhibit very marked traits of intelligence so that an incident worthy of note is of extremely exceptional occurrence a cream-coloured common toad discovered in the neighbourhood in eighteen ninety one was incarcerated in a large fern case thus at once removing it from a sphere of usefulness and ending its adventures into this same case was introduced a viviparous lizard which after a few days tenancy was suddenly missing on search being made the end of its tail was seen protruding from the mouth of a toad 
the unfortunate creature having been seized and swallowed by an amphibian by no means so long as itself lobsters deformities and interesting accidents are far less frequent among lobsters than among crabs at least so my experience leads me to believe in june 1895 i was fortunate in seeing a fairly large lobster that not a great while previously had lost a pincer claw by some accident but a stump a less than half length piece in fact of the joint or section next the carapace remained out of the centre of which sprang a minute but perfect new claw very little more than a fifth of the length of the full-grown claw remaining intact on the other side two pincer claws of lobsters came to hand in july 1901 one had the free keeler half the normal length and the other had the fixed end curved the wrong way after the manner of the beak of the avocet two teeth-like processes however met the free keeler in the latter example so that it was quite capable of strongly seizing any object crab notes in january and february there appears to be an inshoring of spider crabs the species known as hyas coarctatus is in this colder part of the year frequently thrown ashore by the waves where feebly struggling it falls an easy prey to the hooded crows or is flung among the flotsam at the tide mark to be presently covered by drift sand it is usually found in a soft state the old jacket having been but recently cast the frost very soon puts an end to its forceless squirming on the first of october eighteen ninety one a very fine edible crab measuring seven and a half inches across the carapace and scaling twelve pounds seized a mussel used as bait by an angler from one of the piers who secured it the animal having made its escape less possible by entangling the line about its claws this like occasional specimens taken in the shrimp nets had been swept southwards from the cromer crab grounds by a strong tide myriads of shore crabs carcinus minus swarm on braid and mud flats the small trawl nets used for procuring the eel pelts viviparous blennies that are used as baits for eel lines come up with hundreds at a haul the eel babbers are pestered by them sometimes half a dozen gathering on and clinging to the worms upon their line anglers spend half their time rebaiting the hooks so assiduously stripped by them every time the line is put overboard up the bure even into the fresh waters they travel everywhere annoying and constantly trying the tempers of those whose lines and nets they infest anglers for butts or flounders in the bure usually smash every one they haul in having not the satisfaction of minimizing the evil but revenge on a particular individual who has tried perhaps to add injury to insult by endeavouring to hurt the fingers that peevishly wrenched it off the baits in the late autumn of eighteen ninety eight a local angling club thought to turn the perseverance and numbers as well as the greed of the pugnacious crabs to account by offering prizes for the greatest weight taken on one line one fellow baiting with a string of fresh whitings secured first prize with eleven and a quarter pounds the second prize man fished with a sheep's head of the many thousands of shore crabs i have seen and examined 
i only once met with a specimen with a deformed pincer claw the upper or free keeler being only half the normal length and slightly upturned instead of rounded among the many deformities i have met with in cancer pagurus the edible crab may be mentioned the following one may the twenty ninth eighteen ninety seven the free keeler on the larger pincer claw when held point downwards was strikingly suggestive of a wellington boot an extra point curving off at a right angle with a small knob in the part corresponding with the instep this specimen was figured in the zoologist two april the thirtieth eighteen ninety eight a large claw of the edible crab brought me which had the fixed keeler supplemented by a second placed at half a right angle to it but instead of being only one pointed at the end divided and became v-shaped three july the tenth eighteen ninety nine a large crab claw on this date was given me the upper or free keeler having three points to it the lowest point shutting to the lower keeler in the usual way the three points made quite a w i obtained one very similar to this in july nineteen o one four september the nineteenth eighteen ninety nine a large claw at a fishmonger's was discovered to have an extra keeler growing from below the fixed point and almost at right angles to it this at the end looked very like a fleur-de-lis it was dispatched to cambridge five a the small claw of an edible crab had a v-shaped point very like a swallow's tail five b another possessed two points both free and working as if on a hinge september the seventeenth nineteen hundred six april the thirteenth nineteen o one the oddest malformation i have yet obtained was a small claw of the large edible crab it possessed three distinct points and had two separate joints that is a v-shaped point that worked on its own hinge and the single point on its own distinct pivot seven may the twenty seventh nineteen o one the pincer claw of a crab had on the free keeler near its point a large knobbed process as large as a bean when closed the claw had the appearance of grasping a big black bead eight september the eighth nineteen o three a big claw from a large crab had a point growing out from near the centre of the last section or palm and at right angles to the fixed keeler between them protruded a small point after being exhibited at a zoological society's meeting this specimen was handed over to the natural history museum nine on the same date a second came to hand having the fixed keeler short and stumpy yet very sharp at the end held sideways in the hand the grotesque member looked for all the world like the head and mandibles of a macaw only the free keeler was not quite so much curved the common shore crab has a habit of hiding in hollows in the rons that still border braden in places when the tide has receded from the flats those unable to scuttle into hiding and left on the flats creep under the matted zostera marina and there remain until the tide returns others sink themselves into the soft ooze which finds its level immediately above them those in the hollows of the rons holes scooped out by the constant lave of the water 
lie piled upon each other in heaps sometimes hundreds thick here they remain mutually agreed upon a toleration and good behaviour that far from characterise them when the flood tide again sets them at liberty to scuttle in search of food or fight as the case may be i first discovered these monster gatherings when in cutting a rond edge vertically so as to face it with wood to form a kind of quayside for my houseboat the spade sliced through quite a peck of them i have had many a bit of fun with the shore crabs that haunt the corner of braden where my houseboat is located after meals the waste pieces of fish bloater skins and other offal are thrown into the shallow water to the intense interest of these scavengers bones too large for some little fellow to drag away give occasion for a show of bullying at the claws of a larger relative free fights take place between evenly matched rivals and a great deal of threatening is indulged in it is seldom anything serious happens for the weaker one promptly shambles off to a safe or respectable distance and the successful claimant either shuffles off with its prize to the shelter of a piece of sea rack or if its find be too large begins to pull off pieces which are hurriedly stuffed into its mouth i was very much interested in july 1901 at seeing a jellyfish moving about in a shallow trailing its tentacles behind it on the mud a couple of crabs followed it up closely seeming very much inclined to get a nip if possible yet on the slightest change of movement they nervously bolted aside i left them still manoeuvring like a cruiser harassed by a couple of dodging torpedo boats seaside scavengers in the sunnier days of summer the sandhopper talitrus locusta is fairly common on the beach spending much of its time amongst the debris cast up at the tide mark one has but to turn over the refuse there accumulated to bring to light swarms of all sizes which are soon surprisedly skipping away to other places of shelter and disappearing again as if by magic there is very little that is of an animal or a vegetable character that defies their powers of assimilation dead fish birds weeds and even bits of writing paper anything in fact that can be nibbled is good enough for them young and old are as busy as bees it may be that the young remain with their parents until they attain maturity as suggested by a certain writer but i am inclined to think that the gregarious habits of the species have more to do with the keeping together of great and small than any possible family ties or mutual understanding the ringed plover and many another small shore bird are close students of the doings of the species and account for the demise of not a few in the august of eighteen ninety nine early one morning i found a large place head washed up by the sea a considerable company of small black flies actora ostium and another of sand hoppers had taken possession and were immensely busy above and below on kicking the head the host of participants in the feast decamped some of the sand hoppers tumbling out of the orifices in it below and a few of the flies in amazement creeping from the mouth and gill cover above there is little doubt in my mind that the flies discover their food by their sense of smell whilst the others use both eyes and organs corresponding with the sense of smell 
having cleared the table of occupants i picked up the fish's head and threw it a few yards farther along upon the same line of flotsam the wind was blowing from the land and the insect hunters were mostly engaged in their business between the tide mark and the sea and so were to the leeward of their breakfast in less than three minutes for i timed them as many as ninety-seven insects had again boarded it having worked by twos and threes and fours upwards their progression being in leaps and runs not an insect flew now they would stop a moment like hounds making sure of the scent now they jumped a few inches and then they ran a like distance two occasionally meeting from slightly different angles would fraternize in friendly buzz and gambol and then hurry on together to the joint others were still coming up when i lifted the head again and carried it several yards farther to windward in a couple of minutes seventeen were in to breakfast some having travelled eight yards to get there and once more i removed the head placing it on this occasion nearer the water's edge in three minutes but one insect had discovered it and this was an individual which happened to be passing to leeward the sand hoppers however do the lion's share of the eating and astonish one by the thoroughness as well as the alacrity with which they devour every muscular fragment found upon the small fish and the crabs that are thrown up and left upon the sands perfectly empty crab shells are found and pogs small flatfish and others are very quickly reduced to a mere outside skin and inside skeleton an aged prawn the aesop's prawn pandalus annulicornis is extremely abundant off the norfolk and suffolk coasts pecks of it are often taken daily by each shrimp boat belonging to the port of these craft some seventy or eighty are registered here as is well known these crustaceans shed their outside garment at stated intervals but one i obtained in may nineteen o one had quite a cluster of young acorn barnacles balanus balanoides growing upon its carapace it is evident this jacket had not been recently acquired starfish mishap after a severe northeast gale in april nineteen o two i took a long walk northward of yarmouth along the beach i observed hundreds of five rayed starfishes eurasta rubens and eleven twelve and thirteen rayed stars so Lasta paposa hundreds of empty shells of the horse mussel modolia modolius and with them many sea mice an interesting accident befell the cat of a friend with whom i had left a few of the sun stars to look at during the tea hour the feline member of the family managed to devour the half of one in half an hour's time she could not walk straight and groaned piteously after a collapse of some hours duration she got upon her feet and could just manage to stagger along her jaws which had become rigid relaxed the symptoms were altogether those of poisoning next day however she was herself again and i received emphatic orders never to bring starfishes there again insect notes in the summer of eighteen ninety four a very old house in one of the poorest and most crowded parts of the town was pulled down in order to prevent its coming down on its own initiative for three or four years previous 
a large swarm of bees had taken up their quarters in a part of a chimney that was unused and when the wreckers commenced to unroof the place they met with a rather hostile reception from the wandering insects one man was stung on the eyelid whilst other stings were distributed in a most liberal manner numbers of the bees settled upon the naked rafters while others buzzed threateningly around the despoilers heads a hole was made in the chimney and a bunch of rags stuffed into the aperture with sulphur and paraffin and set fire to this had the effect of stupefying the bees still at home and adding an unwanted flavour to the honey accumulated huge pieces of the comb were pulled out and thrown to the assembled children of tender and maturer ages below for which a general scramble took place some brought plates and dishes in which to carry the comb away i picked up a piece and knocking several bees off it found some of it exceedingly good whilst a portion here and there was smoky flavoured while sucking a bit of comb one man received a sting on his finger whilst another heedless of fresh consignments descending from above was struck on the back of his neck with a huge piece of soft treacly comb that fairly poulticed him two buckets full of spoil in all was appropriated the most curious thing witnessed was when the chimney had been thrown down how the survivors and the homecoming bees wheeled round and round disconsolately and dumbfounded in the air where the chimney had been for two or three summers previous these bees which had discovered the treasures spread upon the various sweet stalls in the market-place made themselves a great nuisance by smothering the sweets by the hundred all day long the following paragraph appeared in the columns of a local paper early in july eighteen ninety seven hemsby destruction of the strawberry crop this parish has been met in the midst of the jubilee rejoicings with a plague of beetles which has totally destroyed the strawberry crop in some instances where upwards of a ton would have been taken not one pound will be gathered this means a loss of many pounds this pest is nowhere to be seen during the daytime but comes in thousands during the night can any reader find a remedy or a destruction for these pests on the strength of this paragraph i went to the village armed with a match-box in order to make a few prisoners for future investigation i went to one grower's place and looked at a half-acre patch of the very dry upland sandy strawberry ground on which were twenty-seven rows of plants the year previous it had yielded between sixty and seventy stones of fruit this year scarcely a stone had been worth the gathering pushing my fingers through the soil under and around the plants i very soon had a handful of beetles black thoraxed dull brown backed and ruddier brown legged little fellows scarcely over half an inch in length known to science as harpalus rufi cornis they're the brutes said the indignant gardener and certainly the brutes had been busy whole clusters of strawberries ripe and unripe having been denuded of their seeds and nibbled where the seeds came out the soil too was riddled by them and so numerous were they that a mole or two had been drilling high tunnels undoubtedly in quest of them for the soil was far too dry for worms the previous year had been quite a grub season so the occupier said although they did no mischief 
at scrapby caister hemsby philby and ormsby where the soil was dry and light the beetles had been exceedingly mischievous whilst at belton and in other marshy districts good crops were the usual thing various letters followed an article of mine published in the eastern daily press reasons for the beetles abundance were suggested as well as remedies advocated two previous mild winters with exceedingly little frost would account for the preservation of many of the grubs and my opinion is that the zeal which characterises the gardeners in that neighbourhood in the slaughter of grub-eating birds was a far greater evil then too the continuous cultivation of the strawberry upon the same fields must surely have been a mistake i advocated turning in the village children to stir up the soil and collect the beetles at a premium and suggested that young fowls more especially ducklings should in future be penned in the vicinity in their season half a dozen of the beetles i carried home i shut up in a glass pot taking care that they should for a few days at least do penance at the end of a week they were tame enough and fairly hungry i tried them with freshly killed dipterous insects but they refused to have anything to do with them but on placing a strawberry amongst them they set to with a zest that showed they were not only hungry but knew what suited their palate they were busy all breakfast time and in broad daylight too and were determined to remain by their treasure even when i twirled the strawberry round by the stalk between my fingers in an hour the berry was completely riddled with holes at belton there are gardens where the soil is quite as sandy and as dry and undoubtedly as suited to the habits of harpalus but the natterjack toad is unusually numerous there so much so that ground vermin of the harpalus kidney are rare enough for the toad has an excellent appetite fortunately for themselves as well as the toads belton folk let them all together alone well knowing the useful purpose they serve in may eighteen ninety nine the larvae of the tipula locally known as daddy longlegs were discovered in the grass of the beech gardens for some unaccountable reason they turned up in thousands each morning pecks of them indeed being seen in the few days of their sojourn above ground they were brushed up and destroyed but the grass was ruined the sparrows took no notice of them in the first week of september the grassy banks of braden walls on the north side near my houseboat simply teemed with crane flies the insects produced from the larvae above mentioned each grass tuft looked like a ripe reed as they clung in clusters to it as one brushed through the grass they fell off in scores and hundreds i do not think i shall exaggerate if i estimate their numbers in millions fortunately a stiff breeze from the landward side of the bank blew them into the salt water of braden and in one day destroyed many of them they floated in thousands on the surface of the water and although daddy is a rare hand at clearing himself from the unwanted element struggling was in vain for the heavy wind very soon forced him back again to perish end of section 15 end of notes of an east coast naturalist by arthur henry patterson